This is the third and probably final video on handling uncertainty. Now the previous videos demonstrated that one of the main reasons for using feedback is to deal with uncertainty in the real world and help to retain desired performance from a system and this could be in the face of parameter uncertainty or disturbances or indeed other forms of uncertainty. However, it's also clear that an arbitrary choice of feedback may not be particularly helpful and could be ineffective and you really need to know how do I design a good feedback to deal with uncertainty. Now before we can design an effective feedback we need to be able to quantify how does uncertainty affect the closed loop behaviour and this is a word that you will come across is called sensitivity. How sensitive is the loop? to uncertainty. Now we'll be honest at the outset, this uh, video is a very brief introduction to some of the concepts but it doesn't go into any of the fine details at all because those are far too advanced. First then, parameter uncertainty and you'll see what we're going to do here is we're going to represent the parameter uncertainty using what's um, often called a multiplicative model. There are others, you can use additive models um, but here you can, we're going to say that the real process, maybe if I put GP, you can see the real process, is the model times 1 plus delta, where delta is assumed to be some small number. Now what we need to do is say, okay, how do the transferences from the target to the input and the target to the output change when you change G? Well, let's write down one of the transferences. Y equals uh, M G over 1 plus m g into r. So clearly, if g has gone to g times 1 plus delta, all I'm doing is adding a 1 plus delta into this formula here and here. So I can see fairly clearly how the transference will change if I introduce uncertainty. In a similar way, I can do the input u equals m over 1 plus m g 1 plus delta into r. Now this might not be particularly informative but it gives you a start. You can see explicitly this is how things change if I have uncertainty in the model. Okay so we've got some simple expressions which we've just done and we've re uh, summarized them here. So the difference between the original uh, model output and the um, I'm getting my tongues tied and the output you get from the perturbed model is given by these two expressions. There does seem to be an R missing in both of these so I'll add that in. There you go. R. Um, now you might argue that sensitivity in some sense is going to be something like y of delta minus y over y but I'm not going to get into um, find details of that. We're just going to use the simple observation that if mg is large then mg over 1 plus mg will tend to 1 and therefore the uncertainty will have little, very little effect because mg times 1 plus delta over 1 plus mg times 1 plus delta will also tend to 1. So one way of rejecting uncertainty is by assuming that mg is large. And that, of course, also has the additional effect that y tends to 1. Now, this is a very simplistic observation, um, just to demonstrate a few points. Now, more advanced modules on sensitivity actually look at the impact of this delta on loop stability. And therefore, what you want to investigate is how big this delta can be before the pole polynomial, or the closed loop pole polynomial, goes from stable to unstable, but that's um, way beyond the remit of these videos. So some examples then. You'll see what I've done here is I've allowed the controller to take five different values, 1, 5 and 10. So let's put that in the boxes here. This figure m equals 1, this figure m equals 2, that's not 2 sorry, 5 and this figure m equals 10. Now what do you notice? I've plotted the closed loop response you get if you just have the model and the closed loop response you get if you perturb the model a bit. So the model, original model was G and the perturbed model, you'll see in the top right hand side, is H 
which is quite similar. Now what do you notice? If the controller gain is small, there's quite a noticeable difference between the two responses. As the controller gain gets bigger, the difference gets smaller, and finally, when the control gain got up to 10, the difference is very small indeed. So increasing the gain tended to reduce, reduce the impact of parameter uncertainty on the behavior. So there's a summary. Increasing the gain reduces the steady state difference. However, what's the downside? Obviously, if the controller is large, it's going to ask for active inputs. So let's have a look at these. And what do you see? In m equals 1, the input goes up to 1 for a disturbance of size 1, and then settles down to 0 0.6. When you had m equals 3, look, the input's gone as big as 5, which is much, much bigger, five times bigger than m equals 1. So although you um, brought the output difference down to be much smaller, you've paid for it with a very active input. And if you look at m equals 10, you see the input is even bigger again. So although you might say increasing m um, helps reject uncertainty, you don't get it for nothing. You pay for it with active inputs. So a second example, and you'll see this is given very similar observations to the previous one. It's a second order model, slightly different dynamics. So if we put in m equals 1, what do we see? Quite a large difference between the responses. m equals 5, the difference gets smaller. m equals 10, the difference gets smaller again. So again, as gain increases, the uh, steady state difference um, gets smaller. So that's the same as we said before. Increasing gain can have negative effects as well. So what are these negative effects? Well, you'll notice as we increase gain, we're starting to get some oscillation in the response. And that's uh, linked to stability. Again, that's a topic that's not part of these videos at this point, but will be in a, another set of videos. There's the inputs. Again, you can see m equals 1, the input only goes up to 1. m equals 5, it goes up to 5. m equals 10, it goes up to 10. And again, you can also see the increasing oscillation in the inputs. So nothing is for free. OK, how about disturbance uncertainty? So we've given a figure here to represent how the disturbance affects the loop. And you'll see we've now got two inputs into the loop. We've got your target R and we've got your disturbance D. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use superposition which was covered in a different video. And what that means is the impact on the loop of R can be separated entirely from the impact on the loop of D. So we can consider D alone without getting mixed up with what's R doing. So that's what we've said here. The relationship between the target and the input and the output is unaffected by the disturbance. So we can consider the disturbance alone and essentially ignore R <coughs> in the analysis which follows. So here we go. How do I find the transference from D to Y and D to U. Now that's covered in the videos on block diagrams, so I'm not going to repeat it. And here you see the answer. Y equals 1 over 1 plus GM times D, and U equals M over 1 plus GM times D, with a minus sign. So we can see exactly what the dependence of the input and the output are upon the disturbance. And in the long term, you could use this to say, oh, right, how do I go about choosing M to make these transferences as small as possible. For now, we're just going to do some observations. And the same observation comes as it did with parameter uncertainty. If you increase the magnitude of GM, then 1 plus GM is getting bigger. And clearly, therefore, you would expect these transferences to get smaller. It might not be quite so clear cut with the U because you've got an M over 1 plus GM. But definitely for the Y, for the output, you can see that increasing m in general will cause the y to get smaller. So an example. Same example as with the parameter uncertainty, except now we've added a disturbance. There it is. We've assumed it's a unit disturbance, um, so that's why they're 1 over s. And what we've shown here is the inputs and the outputs. So we've got the outputs here, and we've got the inputs here as we change n. So what do you notice? If m equals 1, the output isn't, isn't rejected, or the disturbance isn't rejected particularly well, because at m equals 1, what you get, you get a steady state um, effect of nearly 0.6.
when you get to m equals 5, the steady state impact is a bit smaller, it's down to about 0.2, and m equals 10 is down to about 0.1. So as you increase m, the steady state impact of the disturbance is reduced. So that's not surprising. Increasing m tends to help with rejecting the disturbances. What price did you pay? Well, if m equals 1, you can see that the input did this, it went to minus 1. If m equals 5, the input did this, it went all the way down to minus 5. And if m equals 10, you won't be surprised to know that the input went all the way down to minus 10. So nothing is for free again. Um, yes, you can reject the disturbance more effectively with a larger m, but you pay for it with an active input. And just for completeness, here's example 2, again with a unit disturbance, and you can see the same pattern as previously. As you increase m, I'll show the arrow here, you'll see the steady state offset caused by this disturbance gets smaller. However, as you increase m, you're starting to destabilize the loop. So instead of having nice poles with nice smooth behavior, you're moving to complex poles with oscillatory behavior. And indeed, if you increase m too large for a real system, not for this system, you will tend to drive the poles into the unstable region. Um, so you've got a trade-off in practice to how much you can reject the disturbances and the impact on stability. Clearly, looking at the red plot, in this figure here, you can see those inputs are not satisfactory at all. Uh, very large, very active, and quite oscillatory. So steady state sensitivity can be reduced, but it will often be at a cost to input action and oscillation, and even perhaps stability. So in summary, increasing feedback gain can reduce sensitivity to uncertainty, certainly in the steady state, but this can be at the cost of input activity and other performance characteristics. And you'll notice here, we've just done a few examples. We haven't been systematic. For disturbances, you can state very simply the impact on the loops. You get very simple transferences. With parameter uncertainty, it's not quite so clean because the effect of the uncertainty appears in the numerator and the denominator. And the treatment and analysis of that is beyond an introductory module. So it's not covered in these videos, but it's something you may have an interest to do uh, later on. So a general observation, which we've not really talked about here, is you've noticed that to reject the uncertainty, you need a large gain in the steady state. Well, the best way to get a large gain in the steady state, in fact, is to include an integral term. And again, it's a bit beyond the remit of these videos to discuss that type of issue um, in too much detail, but it's an observation that if you include integral, you can remove the uh, steady state offset and therefore you won't necessarily have quite so much detriment um, to the performance with all this oscillation. Um, if you look at the videos on offset, you'll find there'll be a brief discussion of that in the context of disturbances.